Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to another session of Franchising with FASA. I'm Romani Thresh, and our guest today is Garth Cullis. We've had him before, associate at Fairbridges, Wortham, and Becker. And a welcome to everybody out there. It's a warm, sunny day here in, in, in Cape Town, South Africa. I don't know where what it's like over where you are. Let us know. But if you're watching this, please hit the like and share button. Share this with people who might want to know more about the Consumer Protection Act, how that works, what the policies are in relation to returns, and uh, everything about the Consumer Protection Act. So, hello, Garth, and how are you today? Good morning, Romy. I'm well in the show. Are you having a good first season? I am, I am, I am. Um, just to give everybody a bit of a background about Garth, Garth is an associate uh, in the Commercial Law Department at Fairbridge's Worth Heim and Becker. Garth's experience includes drafting of various commercial agreements, including franchise and shareholder agreements, share sale agreements, pledge agreements, commercial leases, and documentation for mergers and acquisitions and memorandums, MOIs. Uh, Fair Bridges, Wortham & Becker is a law firm who offers commercial law advice, the drafting of franchise documents. They also register trademarks and give intellectual property law advice, labor law advice and electronic communications and transactions advice. So grab a cup of coffee and in a moment we'll be chatting with Garth Kalix at Associates, uh, who is an associate at Fair Bridges, Wortham & Becker about the Consumer Protection Act and what you need to know with relation to returns and so on and so on. So we'll be back shortly. So hello, hello. Oh, what was that? <laughs> hello and welcome. Again, uh, reminding everybody to please hit the like and share button. Share this with people who would be interested in finding more, learning more about the Consumer Protection Act, how that works for you in relation to the returning of goods. Also, just want to remind you that FASA is a non-profit organization. Uh, franchise businesses and suppliers who are members of FASA uh, have agreed to follow a code of con a code of ethics are in support of ethical franchising. So, um, over to you, Garth, and let's talk about the Consumer Protection Act. I must tell you, I had a really I had a recent experience this year that started pretty much in June and is still um, semi-resolved now, finally, but I must be honest with you, uh, the Consumer Protection Act didn't help me much because apparently they're not part of the Consumer Protection Act board or something like that. I had to turn to elsewhere, but if these organizations are not in place, you don't have a leg to stand on. I must say, it would have cost me 2,000 Rand if it wasn't for uh, being able to approach an organization such as the Consumer Protection Act uh, it would have cost me 2,000 2, Rand. And thankfully, uh, due to having these organizations in place, um, I did not have to fork out uh, that amount of money for poor service delivery. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking how some companies get away with such poor service delivery and then expect customers to pay for that service. So, yes, let's chat about that. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us, how does the Consumer Protection Act regulate return policies? So what the Consumer Protection Act does in relation to return policies, it sets certain minimum requirements and leaves a lot to the stores itself. So what it does is in certain instances, a consumer can return the goods, but this right is not absolute. It's it's more on the exclusion base. The first one we'll discuss is if you are approached through direct marketing. Let's say you receive a flyer or you add somewhere, you will approach by agent about this goods. You go and you buy it. You then get the automatic, automatic right for cooling off period five days after purchase. So, which is basically a week. So, if you bought goods through direct marketing, which is how most of the advertising is done. You have five day period to return the good as a minimum standard. Uh, I'll elaborate a bit more on that afterwards. And then if you find that the agent, for example, told you 
or the store told you that it's going to perform a certain function that you can't you go and you take it and you can't you can return it returns within five days. Um, then the next instance is the automatic right uh, product product and uh this is now we the word put slots come in. So if you buy IT and they don't tell you there's any defects, you're not made aware of any defects, you're thinking you're buying a product free of defects within six months. You can return the good you are not a monitor, you're not the way of these defects. Uh, the only downside is um, obviously show that the defects doesn't arise sorry the sounds a little bit bad i'm just trying to pick up so what are you saying um you know, is this a bit of muffle i'm not sure where that's coming from um so i'm just trying to pick up so in six months you can return you have a you're allowed to return a product within six months uh if there's a defect on the product however yeah. you think that there is a downside to that what is that downside the downside is that um, it only applies if you are not made aware of the defects. And if the defects are through no fault of your own, for example, you fiddle with it, but broke, or you fiddle with it and you discover the defect, then you can't um, on face value your And if you're made aware of the defects, then you knew they were there, so you lose that right. That's where it is so but the defect to be clearly explained to you. You can't you know, you anymore. You need to say this is wrong for the product, that is wrong for the product, not be taking it as well. Um, so what the consumer does is provides a right to knowledge, you need to know what you're buying, um, you need to have good quality goods, but if you the goods are of a certain quality, you need to know what's wrong with it. So you can return in those instances. So those, and then what most stores do, the only minimum stand is most stores have their own return policy, which is right to return the policy. Um, and there's various reasons why they have this. First, they could just be generous. Secondly, if you are more kind to clients, provide them with that exhibit, they're more likely to purchase more goods from you. Um, after your reputation as well. So it's not advisable to just go with these minimum standards that are in the Consumer Protection Act. Many stores have only term policies that offer more protection. And this is why we check the full flip and the, the policy to know what the protection you have. Okay, thank you, Garth. Um, I'm just having a bit of, I'm just trying to see because some of the people in the audience um, that I'm noticing on Facebook are saying that the sound is a bit bad. Um, I'm not sure because you're not very clear. There's a bit of muffling come in. So mm. let's just see how it goes. Um, um, yeah, let's see how it goes and see if we can improve the sound. Otherwise, we might have to go out and come back in and, and, and try mm. that again so as i'm understanding is oh yes well that's that's a bit understandable that if you've broken a product uh or you've manhandled the product or you're aware that a product is defective then you cannot expect to take something back to the store um for example uh you have, for example, bought a product. I mean, we had that recently where uh, a product was defective. Then you can go take it back to the store as long as you've got the slip, am I correct? And also the packaging that it came in. So the only one downside that I found with these things is that you have to keep the packaging that it came in and sometimes one especially if it's a big box or whatever one doesn't want to really be storing empty boxes around your property so that is probably one uh downfall of having 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 uh to a defective product so hopefully we don't uh you're also saying that that stores have their own customized um did i hear correctly that stores would have their own customized return products Yes, that's 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 correct. Um, they don't have to just conform to the minimum standards. They can provide extra protection to the consumers. Most stores do. So, for example, longer return periods, more lenient returns, they aren't as strict as set out in the Consumer Protection Act. 
And like I mentioned before, I feel this is important because if you show that you care about your consumers, your customers, you're more likely to go back and purchase from you because they know they don't have to go to a rigmarole rule to return the good and they know they have a bit longer to return the good as opposed to a week because we're all busy. And now with the festive season, everybody's buying gifts. And as you know, I buy a gift on the 15th for Christmas. We don't open it until the 25th, which in the cooling off period has lapsed. Um, so that would make consumers ready. So these stores have extra um, return policies to cater for that and to make people feel more safe about purchasing from that on that store. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that is of a concern. I mean, I'll give you an example. I recently, just as you were saying, I recently bought a product and uh, I'm thinking, okay, well, it's definitely going to be lapsed five days because, you know, obviously it's a gift or whatever. And so, yes, that would be a concern, uh, mm -hmm. especially you've got that five, only a five day window period. Is that any day or is it working days only? Because most law applies to working days only. Uh, that's working days, so it's a week. Um, but still, if you're buying Christmas presents early December. Yes. The roof left by Christmas. And that's why it's important to check the store's policy um, in addition to the CPA, because you could have a longer return period as is the case with most stores, uh, and to be more accommodating, especially at this time of year. Well, that would be nice because I think we need to return to, uh, it feels like a lot of especially corporate type of business seem to just forget about the little man. They don't care about, they just care about the profits. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. nice to find businesses that are still per, um, personal, that still understand that you know what, there's a holiday period, uh, factor that in, and let's work with the person, not against the person, because like you say, you want to be able to retain loyalty, retain mm. customers, and I think in a, such a dark climate today, uh, that is crucial, especially if you want to main, keep your doors open. Um, I'm just trying to think of a service I used the other days, and I'm thinking, gosh, well, you guys must have a lot of business because, oh, yes, <laughs> I remember now what that was about, and I'm thinking, gosh, these people must have a lot of business because they're quite happy to reject customers <laughs> without giving it much of a thought or a care or a concern. Yes. Tell us, does it apply to online purchases, return policies? Do Are they different to store purchases? Yeah, the nature of online purchases are slightly different to in-store purchases, and that's because you don't really have the opportunity to go in and assess the product yourself. Um, I would say a picture is worth a thousand words, but with online shopping, you find that a picture is worth a thousand unspoken words. You don't really get the chance to examine the goods. Sometimes a picture can be very different from how it actually looks when it arrives. So there's a bit more leeway. You have a general right to return with online purchases of seven days, at seven general days a week, after you've received it, um, at no extra cost. You don't have to provide a reason. You can return within seven days after delivery. Um, and then, of course, you will have the six-month period for defects as well. So online purchases are regulated in terms of ICTA and CPA, and in-store purchases in terms of the CPA. So there's a bit more leeway with on, online purpose purchases in that you don't have to provide a reason within a cooling off period to return item. Although they still ask you, uh, but yes, I must say, I do, do find it easier to return stuff in the online world. They don't ask mm -hmm. questions, they just return it, you get your money back, no questions asked, which I mm -hmm. do like because yes, as you say, Sometimes, and this is very scary because I've noticed, especially lately, especially in the property sector, people are purchasing property online. There's no more visitations, no more uh, um, stuff uh, where people can go and view the property, see whether they like it or not. It's almost like, okay, well, you're buying a property online and yes. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see how that could be wise. I mean, if you're going to live in a home, you need to see what you're living. Um, yeah, because the online view to me is not what you experience in the real world. But that's recently, uh, one of my, my, my colleagues, they're busy 
selling their house because they want to move out the area. And um, it's, it's being sold on auction and there's absolutely no visitation whatsoever. People view the property online and then they make a bid and buy the purchase of the property online. Um, a friend of mine as well, her, her sister recently, uh, who's living in another country, uh, purchased a property online without viewing the property and purchased it over here. And to me, I'm not sure I could get used to that idea. Uh, I want to see because the very first property I bought <laughs> had no rules in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> something that you don't think about when you're dying and when you move in you go hang on a moment <laughs> Yeah, with the, with, the, with the new normal with this COVID and people being extra cautious, the online environment has been boosting. Um, people are very cautious to go to stores, They're able to purchase online now. But again, anything has a positive and negative. When you go into a store, you go more with the product. And buying online, you have to wait for delivery. Obviously, you pay delivery fees and that. And yeah, so you don't instant as is the case with walking into a store. So have to weigh pros and cons, but as for buying a house online without doing it, I don't see any pros <laughs> with it. No, I don't know how you can get out of that one if it's defective or you find that when after purchasing, that's not really what you wanted. I don't know how you'd get out of that one. Um, tell us, what are the significance of the terms and conditions for online purchases? It's very important, although often ignored, so the T's and C's, regarding online purchases is the thing that we all ignore. We uh, we're excited to get that product in. We feel we don't have the time, but what you're actually doing by clicking accept, Yeah. <laughs> what you're actually doing by clicking accept the terms and conditions is you're accepting contractual terms. You're bound by that. Uh, so as I said, knowledge is power. If you're clicking yes to terms and conditions are agreeing it, you're agreeing without knowing what you're agreeing to. So it's very significant. I mean, you could be accepting that delivery will only come within a month and you wanting this thing next week, but you've consented to the terms and conditions. You could be missing important information about costs. You could be seeing the costs. You could be missing delivery costs, shipping fees, those things, or costs that you're not aware of. Um, that is true. Yeah. So Thank you, you. I fell prey of that a few years ago. I purchased something and I didn't read like all of us do. And I think most, probably because these terms and conditions are really, really long winded. And a lot of them you don't understand. It's not mm. really in simple, mm. plain English. So it does make it very cumbersome for someone on the receiving end to read those but yes i did fall prey of that i think there was an extra cost or it was something to do with the delivery um you've passed sparked my memory in that regard yeah but what's very important to know regarding terms and conditions and information regarding products uh, cpa does stipulate that it needs to be an understandable language it needs to be drawn to your attention um on that note I can say all terms and conditions are drawn to our attention. Otherwise, you wouldn't know um, enough about it to ignore it as we do. Mm. Um, so they are all drawn to our attention, but they need to be in plain, understandable language so that people know what they are contracting. It's no different from me walking up with a contract and telling you to sign. And you're signing immediately. Um, that's what you are doing when you're ignoring terms and conditions. So I strongly advise with any purchases, um, or the more expensive, the more important, uh, that you read those terms and conditions and see what you are consenting to. I think in the South African context, the thankful thing is that the law did change in that they must make things easy to understand mm. for the person, which I really do appreciate. Mm. Because now when you go overseas, it's not quite the same. And the, 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 the is a little bit more jargon uh, than one would likes to have. Tell us, are warranties for items absolute? Uh, it's an important thing, yeah. Um, before I go to that, I need to split um, the term warranties into two categories. The first one we touched on briefly is the is a warranty against um, latent defects, a defective product. We have six months to return it. Uh, that's, that's, that's absolute in the sense that if you spot those defects and and you wish to return it, um, you can either get your money back 
you can accept um, uh, you can accept the exchange or you can accept that they repaired it. Um, so those are the three options. As long as the requirements are met, there is still no fault of your own and that you have no idea about these defects. So you have the right there to choose which one you want. And the second category of warranties is the one extended to you by the store itself, which is outside the minimum requirement of the six months that we've discussed now. Sometimes stores give you a one, two, three year warranty. Um, those are not absolute because they're giving you grace so they can stipulate the terms of that warranty. So again, you have to familiarize yourself with the store's warranty policy when it's longer than six months. Uh, six months within the CPA, that's uh, on your side, it's your friend. As soon as we step outside that six mark, six month mark, uh, what the store is after the goodness of their heart granting to you, basically. And you have to familiarize yourself with their warranty period because then it's up to them, basically. As long as they meet the requirements of the CPA providing the six month from month seven, it's up to them how they would like to regulate their warranty. So those are the two categories that I feel important to touch on and it's important to touch on when it's absolute and when it's not. So it's important so I can't stress this enough to familiarize yourself with those one, two, three year warranties because they are not the same as in the case with the six months. They are not absolute. And the rules are slightly different. So yes, especially when you're buying big purchase or long term purchases such as your fridges, your washing machines, tumble dryers. Mm -hmm cars check out for those warranties read and make sure you are up to speed uh, a friend of mine bought a product recently um, it's one of those gas kind of things and it was defective she returned it to the store but they wouldn't replace it with a new one they would only repair it which annoyed her a little bit but it was mm -hmm. in the warranty so there was nothing much she could do about it so mm -hmm. yes important read those terms and read those warranties um one of the things that happened quite a lot is someone sees an ad it actually happens <laughs> uh the person reads a warranty uh, or you, you you see some special promotion in the uh in a newspaper or something you've read online and you go to the store but they're out of stock mm. What is that? Is does that fall under the Consumer Protection Act, or is that so sorry we're out of stock? So it's very limited in terms of the CPA. Uh, it's more regulated, but the CPA's regulation of it is the right to knowledge. So if stock is low, they need to inform the consumers in that ad that stock is low. That's why you always hear T's and C's apply while stock's lost. Uh, they're fulfilling the obligation in that right, informing the consumer that stock is low. Um, this is only available while stock is there. Um, so you don't have the right for, for it to be there when you arrive. Um, you need to be quick mm. about it, is what they're saying. But on that note, they are within their rights. In the policy, grant you extra rights um, to say that if you come in so and the item is not here, um, you get a voucher to get the product when it is available or we'll get it from one of our other branches for you. But they need to put that within their policy. I mean, um, when I was younger, I worked in retail and we'd often do this where we don't have the product, we source it from another branch, or we'll get it elsewhere, or we'll make a note that when you come again, you get that product at the same price. We, retailers can extend their right to the consumers, but they aren't obligated to do so as long as they clearly stipulate it in the ad while stock loss. Where they don't, where they just say this is available, that's where they can be tackled by the consumer to say, so you did not say this is limited, so I expect when I walk in here that I can get my things. But I've, I've not heard the uh, special promotion ads without that while stocks loss or T's and C's apply. And again, if they don't say while stocks loss, but they say T's and C's apply, and in those T's and C's, they stipulate that it's limited and you don't read it, again, they don't have to give you that prior. But they have every right. Um, to extend you that courtesy of getting it to you another time. But it needs to fall within the policy. Tell me something. Um, a lot of stores uh, either say they will repair it or they'll give you store credit. Is that mm. legal? So if you want your money back versus, I mean, sometimes you don't really want a refund and mm. you don't want credit, you want your money back. 
Mm. Is that legal? Well, they can they can offer you the options of repair, refund, or exchange if it's within your cooling off period or if it's within your latent defect period. They can offer you, but it's not for them to decide. When it's outside those periods, that is when they can stipulate how they reimburse you. So if it's outside um, the exchange cooling off period or outside of the warranty period, it's up to them what they want to give you. So they well within their rights, but it falls within those cooling off periods, within those warranty periods, and then they they don't have the option. It's the consumer, the customer's choice whether they want their money back or whether they want repair. But if it's outside the period, they're well within their rights to stipulate how they wish to reimburse you. And so the important thing is what period it's in. Um, are you in warranty? Are you in the cooling of period? Once you're outside, then you lose your power. That's interesting. So mm. coming back to the story of my friend who had this item that was defective. Okay, mm. I and it was outside the warranty period, so where she was only they had to repair it or something. But mm. let's say she was within that five per day cooling off period, they mm. have to replace you with the money and not if you ask for that. Yes, yes. As long as as long as she bought it as a result of direct marketing. Um that's the thing. Often we go to lesser known stores. Um Again, I can't mention names, but I think you know which stories I'm talking about where you never saw a pamphlet, you just came across them and you walk in there and they say no money back. <laughs> They're not breaching any rules because there was no direct marketing. You stumbled across them. Um, so there they have more power. Um, obviously, the bigger ones use direct marketing more. They use ads more. And if within that period, no, the shares, every right, demand the money back. Okay, okay. I, I missed that part in understanding. So you walk into a store and there's no direct marketing and you buy a product um, and it's defective and you go back within the cooling off period. No, if it's defective, you always have that right within six months. But if you just change your mind, you don't want it anymore, uh, and there's nothing wrong with the product and there was no direct marketing involved in oh, they don't have to give your money back. That's why you see many of the smaller own stores have this no refund policy and they get away with it because they're within their rights to do so. Ah, okay. So if it's defective, yes, but if you're returning it because you changed your mind, no, that's a problem. You won't get a refund. Ah, that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very insightful. Gosh, uh, time absolutely flies. We're having fun. <laughs> And it's uh, the Christmas season, so wishing everybody uh, a good time. I know most of you will be in solitude because we've all been on lockdown and again lockdown. So uh, let's be mindful of that and let's uh, think about those who are spending time alone this Christmas festive season. Mm -hmm. And once again, if you want to get hold of Garth and uh, Garth Cullis at Fair Bridges, Wertheim and Beckham, I will be posting a link in the comment box below. You can get hold of them to discuss franchise agreements or maybe Consumer Protection Act issues. How does one, just quickly before we end, um, how, when does one contact the Consumer Protection Act? what would be the stages because obviously the consumer protection act would want you to follow a certain procedure and a certain criteria can you just share that with us before we close off okay um i'm a big fan of the process but uh <laughs> it's the process so here it goes so you have to lodge a complaint with a relative ombudsman different industries have different ombudsman they have a general consumer ombudsman then there's a motor ombudsman for example and with other indices, a specific ombudsman, so you have to lodge a complaint to them. Uh, so you fill out the form, the particulars, uh, the basis of your complaint, evidence, they evaluate, they give the store a chance to state their case, and they come to a determination. Uh, now, because of all the steps, it is quite time consuming. Returning a TV, for example, can drag on for a bit. Um, but those are the steps. So what you're doing, you lodge a complaint. Um, there's no extra costs involved, really, because you, you just lodge the complaint, you set out the basis. There's a form to fill in. I think maybe we can make the form 
example available on the website or something, uh, you attach the evidence and they assess it. Um, we see if the store can prove that there was no defect or it's your fault of their own, then obviously they'll dismiss your complaint. But if your complaint is valid, they'll accept it and they'll direct the store to give into your demand. But what you have to first do is approach the store directly. And besides it being the normal course, it's advisable because you can resolve it within one day. When they continuously refuse and then you take it further, you lodge the complaint and the process follows its course. But um, like I say, it can be quite time consuming in that route. Um, so the best bet is obviously trying to resolve with the store itself. It is. And I mean, I must say most places are approachable, but there are the odd occasions where things do go wrong. And my advice would be also to make sure that you've got everything recorded, because mm. that is something that the Consumer Protection Act and any of these bodies will expect. They want to see a history that there has been communication with the store involved or the entity involved, there must be some a paper trail almost of that communication making those requests. And in my experience, I've just learned to put everything in black and white, uh, put it in email, put it there, make sure it's there in black and white that you've made that request on numerous occasions that there has been correspondence because that's one of the things the Consumer Act will um, mm. or is associate will want from you. So once again, just to thank everybody for watching today, uh, please remember to hit the like and share and share this with someone who is interested perhaps in knowing more about the Consumer Protection Act, maybe they've had an experience. Uh, you do have rights and they do work. I have experienced them twice in my life where companies wanted me to pay for something that I didn't feel I des should be paying for. And because I had the paper trail and I had made the effort to approach the stores, I didn't have to fork out that money and et cetera, et cetera. Because what happens is what happened to me is they start threatening you to put you, list you on the Consumer Protection Act database. That's what happens, especially if you refuse to pay for something that you feel is not mm -hmm. your right. Um, and that's what happened to me. They wanted me, they were going to list me on the credit bureau. And eventually I said, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to report you. And eventually, and immediately um, the story changed. And then I got uh, people working. I mean, this was dragging out for six months. So, yeah, just to remind you of that. So in closing, FAST is a non-profit organization that protects, lobbies, and promotes and develops ethical franchising across all sectors within South Africa with a specific focus on transformation. If you would like to know more about membership as a supplier or as a franchisor, uh, please get hold of FASA. You can visit them and find out more information at www.fasa.co.za. And that's it for us. Uh, have a wonderful week further, a wonderful festive season, whatever it is you're doing. Thank you for joining. Thanks, guys. All the best for the holidays. Thank you, guys. Bye.